Another phenomenal podcast for you today, gang. Today is sponsored by Deckhand Sports. We got the man. We got Cliff Gray coming to us live from down in Puerto Rico. It's going to be insane today. I want you all to kick back, relax, and enjoy this podcast. You're going to learn a lot about stuff that I don't even know about. We're going to learn about hunting. We're going to learn about spearfishing. We're going to learn all kinds of cool stuff that he's got going on. But real quick, we got to talk about a couple things we got coming up. We got uh, that Bart Hall show coming up. I'll be up there on Saturday and Sunday at the Long Beach Convention Center. I'll be doing those live stand-up seminars for you you know it's like a comedy show when i'm on front of you standing on stage i'll be starting out at noon with larry hansen on the 27th and then on the and then at three o'clock in the afternoon on the 27th i'll be up on the stage all by myself doing a seminar and i'm kind of scared about that because you know i'm not good at speaking in front of people and then on sunday i'll be doing the same thing 12 o'clock with larry hansen and then Three o'clock up on the main stage all by myself. And be in between, I'll be in the CCA booth because remember what I always say, we got to support CCA. They're the only voice we have at the table. Everywhere you look, they're trying to shut down fishing and they're trying to shut down hunting. And the only thing we have going for us is CCA. So I'll be hanging out at the CCA booth, hoping that you come and visit me at the booth and sign up to CCA and give us a donation so we can fight this radical that's going on to stop fishing and hunting in the great state of California. Well, like Frank Lepresti says all the time, they're trying to shut down fishing in the United States of America, period. So we got to work on this. So CCA and myself will be working hard at it. I'll be there both days in their booth, hanging out before the show opens. And then during the show, when I'm not on stage, I'll be hanging out with them. So I just wanted to get all that out there. And we'll talk more about uh, Deckhand Sports. We'll show you a cool little video in a little bit. But, hey, without any further ado, let's bring Cliff in here and see what's going on where you're at today. What are you doing, man? What's up? What's up, what's up man? Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so excited. I cannot believe you were on Joe Rogan's podcast. Now you're on Dave Hansen's podcast. <laughs> I'm sorry for the letdown, my friend. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wouldn't call it a letdown, man. I'm pumped. I don't get to do a lot of kind of fishing-oriented ones. And it's, uh, you know, I'm known for elk hunting and, and that whole world. And uh, so it's fun to uh, to get with somebody that shares a different type of passion with me, man. So so I love it. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much. That makes me feel good inside. So look, you do all you've done so much cool stuff, taking guys hunting all over, getting elk, which is a big deal. It's like a bucket list animal for most guys that hunt, going out there and getting that elk and getting out there. And I just saw a cool video you posted on. Uh, instagram of that ram that you lost in the hills well we're going to talk about all <laughs> kinds, we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff gang he's got a phenomenal instagram page with lots of really bitching content he's also got a youtube channel he's got tons of stuff going on also you can go see him over there at joe rogan's podcast learn a little bit more about him but we're going to do something that you and Rogan didn't even talk about. We're going back. We're going way back to when you first started. Who got you outside going hunting, going fishing, doing all the cool stuff that you do now as a lifestyle? But somebody got you into this, right? Yeah. So it's kind of an interest. I mean, it's, it's interesting to me, Dave, because a lot of people who know my background, they know my family, they assume that really my passion for hunting, my passion for, my, for the outdoors came from my dad. Cause my dad was an outfitter when I was a kid in that, in that Western Colorado, central Colorado wilderness area, he was a cattle rancher. And then seasonally he was an outfitter. So we always had, you know, pack mules and horses and seasonally he, that's what he did for, you know, three or four months a year. So that was what everybody assumes was my real exposure to it. And the reality is, is that I love my dad, but he, I don't think he did it on purpose, but he really didn't introduce me to the world of hunting he didn't really like taking me and my brother's hunting. I think it was because he did it for a living. And, and I'm sure you've been exposed to guys like this. You know, they're fishing every day. They're guiding fishermen. The last thing they want to do with their kids is spend more time fishing. I, I, it's, like, it, sound, it probably sounds weird to a lot of your listeners, but internal to the guiding community, it's pretty normal, actually. So the, the plus side of that was my dad was an obsessive fisherman. So even when he couldn't afford it, when I was a kid, he would take me and my brothers. He took us to Alaska several times. 
he he had a boat probably when he couldn't afford it so he exposed us to fishing that way and then uh he actually i mean i can't tell you how many how many summers and how many christmas vacations i spent down in your neck of the woods i south of you right because you're in cabo dave right exactly yeah you're so it would be San jose yeah so we used to go down to, we used to call it la playita i'm sure you're familiar with the area and i'm talking when i was like you know, the first time I went down there, I was probably five or six years old, the, the age of my kid right now. So my dad used to take take us down there uh, at least once a year. And that was like our big Christmas trip, our big summer trip. We'd go down there for, down there for two or three years. And uh, my, my mother's brother lived down there for about 40 years. So in terms of saltwater fishing, that was my exposure there. And then to wind it back to hunting... I don't know what it was, Dave. I think it was because I got like a little exposure just through the fact that my dad was a, you know, in the business. So I knew what it was. I was around it all the time. But I had this urge in the hunting in the hunting spectrum to always go. Like I remember begging my dad that just, you know, as a 12-year-old kid to go to go duck hunting on the weekend or or whatever. And he he would take me periodically, but he was he's never into it, you know. Um, but I always had that passion. And it's weird because I don't know how you were as a kid. I look at how my kids are now and it, it freaks me out how much my parents let me be on my own. And I, I wish I had the balls to let my kids do it. I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's like this, this innate fear that like if my kids go out on their own, they're going to, you know, they're going to not show back up. But my parents, man, when I was 12, 13 years old, years old, it was normal for me to go hunting every every afternoon. If there was a season open, I went hunting or I went fishing. On the weekends, I'd be gone for seven or eight hours when I was 13, 14 years old. Just me and my dog or me and one of my buddies. So so that's the long-winded uh, answer to your question, man. Well, my dad and I he started taking me when I was three years old on the boats and that's, he loved, he was a different, he, he's a different now. He's kind of like me. We just loved being out on the water. My dad used to take me fishing with him on the boat. I did a podcast with Michael folks. And I remember my mom putting my shoes on when I was three years old, taking me down to put me on the boat with my dad. My dad was like, your dad was a outfitter. My dad was a sport boat captain. Sure. I, I grew up in the industry. And then when I went out with him the first time, when I was three, I knew that's all yeah. I want to do. I don't want to do anything else. I want to be outside. But the whole thing about you're talking about the kids, letting them run free. Yeah. Well, society destroyed that for us. We're, we can't do that anymore. I, my boys grew up a long time ago. They're both 32 and 31 years old and they, they kind of ran free, but never my granddaughter or my grandson, I would never ever even think about letting them do what I let my boys do or what you yeah. or I did when we were kids. It's just society is so different today. You can't let them go out hunting in the woods by themselves. Are you kidding? Like you did or go out on a boat, go fishing all by myself in the middle of the ocean. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, you know what the ironic part is, man, if you if you let your kids do that, probably the most dangerous thing is that they're going to be out there alone with their phone connected to the Internet. <laughs> right. Like that's the that's the worst part about it, man. It's not even the activity that you're worried about. It's the other crap, you know. Oh, yeah. The garbage that comes over the phone. They might yeah, watch yeah. a video by your saltwater guide or maybe by. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Pursuit, cliff pursuit. You might yeah. see something you're not supposed to see. But then you got so your dad was an outfitter, and you guys grew up where outfitting? Where was your dad doing the outfitting thing at? So most people associate that area with Vail, Colorado. Okay. So the big the big ski area. So I didn't live in Vail. That's kind of like uh you know, it's kind of like living in Santa Monica and saying you're you 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 grew up in Beverly Hills, you know. Uh, I grew up in a in a town outside of Vail, but everybody associates it with that with that town. So that area there, um, and it's basically uh, three and a half hours, three hours to the west of Denver, up in the mountains. Okay, did you start out elk hunting? Was that what you dad took you to do the first yeah. time, or what did you hunt? Yeah, so that was my first exposure was elk hunting as a young kid, and then I had kind of a a split childhood because it was it was this is a I guess an oddity that now I realize is odd because now I'm about the age of my father as he was at that time. But my father actually 
changed his life path when he was like 40 years old. He went back to vet school. So the other section of my childhood, I spent in Northern California. And so I had been exposed to elk hunting, mule deer hunting. And then the latter half was more, you know, more waterfowl hunting in Northern California, that sort of thing. So I got exposed to different types of hunting that way, just because my, we moved like, I don't know, five, six, seven times, you know, as a kid. Okay. And then how did you get into, did you just go, okay, I just want to do this outfitting thing because that's what my dad did? Or did you just go, no. I want to show people how bitching this is? No, man. No. So not at all, dude. So, well, so here's the deal, Dave, is when you said that you knew you wanted to do this in life, I think I had that moment as a kid. I, when I was 16, 17, 18 years old, you know, that, that age, I thought for sure, you know, being a hunting guide, you know, wherever in the, in the West or Colorado or excuse me, or Alaska or something like that was always on my mind. And I always wanted to work outside. And then I don't, I don't know what it was like probably when I was 18, 19, 20 years old. I, I've talked, I actually talked about this on a recent podcast I did. I, I somehow got this chip on my shoulder about money and I, I didn't grow up with, you know, we weren't real wealthy. I was always taken care of, but I, I never wanted to be poor. So when I was 18, 19 years old, I got in this mindset of like, I want to make money. So I actually, I went to undergrad, I went to graduate school and I worked in the finance world for, I'm thinking five or six years. And I built, I built a little business up with my brother. I sold that part. I sold my part of the business to him when essentially I was just tired of living in urban areas. So this was when I was like 25, 26. And I was like, all right, that, that world is not for me. I actually moved back to Colorado, same area that uh, I told you I, I grew up in. And I moved back really just to ski with my girlfriend at the time. Now she's my wife, just have fun for, you know, however long and then figure out like the next, the next jump in life, you know, little, little transition phase. And it was funny because I, uh, I knew of an outfitting area that was in the flat tops wilderness area. I knew about it as a kid and it was a well-run business. You know, I think even as a, when I was a kid, they were doing maybe a couple hundred hunts, hundred hunts up there for mule deer and elk, but they were like the gold standard. Well, when I moved, when I went back there, when I was 25, 26, that business had, it had been run into the ground, not by the current owners, but over time it had just had shifted ownership and had a bunch of problems, had a bunch of issues with the, with the federal, you know, the forest service guys who they were in, in bad, uh, bad accord with those guys. So I actually went out there one day with my wife, just drove my Jeep up there middle of October. And we, I remember it vividly because we had had a bunch of, it was more snow than typical, even for mid October. And this, where this place is like the pack station of it's right at like 8,000 feet. And I remember driving up there and it's at the very end of the road, down a dirt road for maybe 30, 40 minutes. And there's a switchback. There's this one big switchback that goes in to the wilderness area. And that's the last road. What makes that area a wilderness area. And it's like 300,000 acres is there's no roads on it. So once you hit that border, there, there's no vehicle access and there's very little trail system. So I saw this old guy walking down that switchback and he was in snow, like thigh deep. And he had a mule and he was, he was dragging behind him. And the mule I could tell was limping, was lame. And so I walked up to him and his name was Jim. And I got to talking to him about him and, he, and he's telling me how he ended up with this outfitting business through a bunch of different transactions and stuff. He was a landowner there. And uh, I looked at him and I had no intention of doing this before I drove up there. But I looked at him and I was like, hey, Jim, would you ever think about selling this thing? And he looked at me and he's like, you better effing believe it. And two weeks later, I had bought the thing. And so and, and honestly, like I thought it was just going to be a, ho- a hobby, Dave. Like at that point, man, I had been you know, not, I, I had had like a prestigious kind of position in the finance world. Right. And that's when, that's when the finance world was like a big thing. When I came out of college, man, I remember buddies going to work for Facebook and those sort of things being like, what a bunch of losers, you know what I mean? I'm going to wall street. Well, it turns out, turns out I was the, I was the, the bad decision maker in that, that deal. But anyways, like I rolled up there like a young kid thinking I was hot shit and this was going to be like my next hobby. You know what I mean? Well, it became like my life and that became my life for 12, 13 years. 
so that's the that's the story man I, and it was in i just built that business back up to what it was i expanded to doing a bunch of booking stuff in british columbia i leased some stuff in texas over the years i just kind of spread out amongst species but always my primary focus was elk and mule deer in, in those wilderness areas and then the whole thing about getting an elk tag, that's a big deal, right? I mean, you just don't go get an elk. I can't go buy an elk tag, right? You got to be in a lottery and all that stuff. For my, Because a lot of my my bosses on the yachts that I run and everything, they, they all hunt. And sure. I've heard stories about it's like winning the lottery to get an elk tag. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this whole like draw world is is uh, a little more foreign to, to the fishing world, but there's a lot of areas. So basically what you deal with on elk in particular is if you can buy a tag like over the counter or if you can draw a tag fairly easy. So maybe it just, maybe maybe you tell me that, you know, Dave, you come to me and you're like, hey, I want to hunt elk at some point in the next couple of years. I'm like, all right, you have to apply for two, three years and then you'll get you'll draw the tag. Right. There's a lot of areas like that. Those would be considered fairly easy tags to draw. And then I did operate in an area where you could just buy tags, but those type of hunts, the access is crazy limited, right? It would be, it would be the equivalent to you doing, you, you know, you're going after some sort of species where you have to go 40, 50 miles offshore, right? Like there's this big barrier to access, right? That's kind of what these areas where you can get, you know, you can re readily available elk tags mean the access is going to be tough. So most of the elk and I did was all you had to pack in on horses and mules, all your camp, e everything had to go in on the back of a horse or mule. So, you know, a lot of, like most of my camps were three or four hours on a horse before you were where you were going to start hunting. Really? That's yeah, crazy. that is a giant yeah. commitment. You look, you got to look at your people that you're guiding and go, and I'm, I'm like me, you look at them and go, there's no way you're going to handle this. <laughs> Dude, it's crazy. Cause I'm, I'm sure you saw this, Dave. Yeah. There's, <coughs> excuse me. There's always that element, but, uh, it's still hard to, it's still hard to handicap. It's probably like you, man, you know, you, you, you get a feeling when somebody gets on your boat, you're like, I think this guy's going to get seasick and it's not him. It's like the, the man's man next to him gets seasick, right? You, it's hard to gauge, you know, mental toughness on things is tough, man. Well, that hiking into the forest in the middle of the forest, like you said, and going out there and my biggest concern, I'm always thinking about, okay, so let's just say I went with you and I got lucky and I got one. Yeah. Now we got to get that thing out of there. That's yeah, where yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to, <clears throat> I mean, I'm cool with hunting. It doesn't bother me. I'm, I love to eat meat. That's like my favorite food. And I know where meat comes from, but I just can't imagine grabbing that giant elk, cutting it up into pieces and then carrying that out of there the way we walked in. No, I can't. I can't yeah, yeah. I can't handle it. So, uh, uh, Jamie's doing a good job or not Jamie, dude, I call him, I call <laughs> Elliot Jamie. Um, sorry, sorry, Elliot, but uh, uh, he, he just, so there's two ways, man. He had one up there. I was packing on a mountain goat on my backpack. So the backpack deal sucks. That's just hard work, you know, backpacking out, out elk in particular, just cause it's, you know, a lot of weight is pretty tough. The majority of my outfitting, we packed out elk via pack mules. So we were quartering, up, quartering them, and then we pack them on two mules. And it's not that's not too bad. That was a big part of the service I provided is just getting all the meat out. And uh, I've got some YouTube videos on it, probably somewhere in there, Elliot on Instagram. There's there's a picture of me, you know, tying one onto the top of the back of a mule. But that's how we got them out, Dave. So you did the guys that paid you to guide them. They didn't have to carry the meat. No, no. I mean, well, some, sometimes they'd have to, you know, they'd have to help us pack it back to camp or whatever, or somewhere we could get a horse or mule mule to it, which in itself could be, could be, you know, pretty trying, but it wasn't having, you know, there you go. There's, so there's a, there's a bull on the back of a, yeah, there you go. Another one there. So uh, we just throw them on the back of mules just like that. Dude, Ellie, I think you could actually give Jamie a run for his money, dude. That was quick. <laughs> yeah, um, you He's very, very good at what he does. There's no, I don't know anybody better than Elliot at what he does, but real quick, 
we're at the we're at that mark where I want to show you something because we're talking about cutting up the animal and taking care of the animal. And now you're into this spear fishing and you're offshore doing the fishing thing. Check out this bag that Dave and the guys over at Deckhand Sport to put together for taking care of your fish. Check this out real quick. This is a pretty amazing video. Isn't that an amazing product? I mean, you've got kill bags on your boat, but they don't do what that one does. Yeah. So actually, uh, the guys that I Wahoo spearfish down here, they use them and uh, they don't have the ribs in them, though. And I could see how that would be uh, nice. I, I, because I haven't dealt with really colorful, you know, like, you know, Wahoo, Mahi, a, whole, a ton in my life. I'm curious, Dave, do you think it keeping them out of the water actually keeps the color better on them? Like if you want to take them out at the, you know, at the, at the shore to take pictures and that sort of thing. Yeah. What I've found is when they're in that water sloshing around all day, they have a tendency to get the colored bleach dried out of them. And you're going to have a white fish with the skin rubbed sure. off. And then you start to look inside of the fish. The gills are going to be like a beige color. If there's any, let's just say you gaffed it or you spit shot it with your spear it's laying in that mucky water and it's going to have a tendency to start to suck that mucky water up into the fish itself so when dave showed me this bag and i saw those ribs and the drainage system in there so it keeps that water out of there which i don't i think that's the key yeah and then when you pull the fish out to take the pictures later and you're like the thing still looks like a wahoo yeah 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 sure so no no man i uh I could totally see how that would be cool. It's the same with all meat, man. If you can keep it out of just soaking in water, it's like, I mean, elk or anything else, same deal. If you leave it in the bottom of a, bottom of a cooler and let it soak and pick it up, it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't look right. A lot of people argue, oh, it's the same. It's not the same, man. It looks completely different. I guarantee it's going to taste different too. Yeah. And as we grew up in the industry, we started to learn that, and it wasn't like that in the seventies when I started fishing for a living, we just didn't really care about, we wanted to catch them and we didn't worry about how we were keeping them. Sure. Now it's all, now we all understand how important it is to make sure your elk, your, your Wahoo, your Dorado, everything's taken care of so that when you get home, you have the best product you could possibly have to eat. That's why I think these deckhand sports bags are cutting edge above all the rest. It makes it just a phenomenal product with all the different tie downs too because your boat's not my boat my boat's not devin cruz's boat everybody's got a different area to tie it down dave and the guys over there they went through the bag they have different tie downs look how it's shaped too it's not like the normal bag where it's flat on the ends the way that he brought it out with that angle that allows oh, sure. it, that allows it to stay open too and it's not pressing against the fish rubbing all their rubbing all the cool color off it just makes it a better product all the way around it's a bitch, yeah, yeah. bitch and bag and we'll get Dave in contact with you later. If there's something that you'd like to do, maybe. Yeah. I'll have to, yeah. I'll have to harass him. Hopefully he ships to Puerto Rico, man. Yeah. He's watching right now. So he can throw a comment up there. He's definitely here. I saw him comment earlier. How, what a bitch and guy cliff is. I'm like, well, he doesn't <laughs> know you. <laughs> he's about to know me when I start harassing him to try to get a free one of those cool bags. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah. There you go. That's what we all love is free stuff for definitely for sure. And then one of my oh, guys, he, he answered, he does ship the PR. There you go. One of my guides that works with me all the time, his name's Sonny and he works up in the channel islands. He is a huge hunter. So he's super excited. Okay. He's here watching this right now. He's one of my guides. And then the reason I brought that up is because at the peak of your outfitting <laughs> business, you had how many guys, I was blown away when you told me how many guides did you have hunting with you at the peak? Yeah. So, so my business was really seasonable, but my seasonal, but my peak like whole employee force 
was, you know, somewhere in the realm of like t- round 20. Um, and that would be, so that would be the peak of my season. And, and I had a bunch of guys that were guiding. And then it might've even been a little bit over that when I accounted for like all my horse guys, I had a crew also, Dave, that j- like would just focus on the horses and mules. And most of those guys were Amish guys. Um, oh, wow. so I had, I had a kind of a mix, a mixed crew, but it was at that level. And I think the peak, if you included like all my private land stuff and, and you excluded the spring stuff I did in Canada and that sort of thing, it was somewhere around 200, 250 hunts a year. Wow. That's incredible. And you, yeah, I get stressed. I get stressed even talking about it, man. Cause I remember <laughs> a lot of pressure, right? People want it. They all want to get that big elk because their buddy got one or they saw your video or they saw your picture. They want a big elk, right? You, well, yeah, there's that pressure, but also, I mean, I mean, I know you've been, you know, captain on big boats and stuff is uh bad stuff can happen. And when you get a high numbers of people, you know, up in remote areas and stuff, you just, every day is a battle of making sure everybody's safe, making sure nobody's lost. I mean, a big part of my season, Dave, if, if a guy spent one night out, you know, out of the, away from camp, there was a chance he was going to be dead. You, if he couldn't start a fire, he's not going to survive one night of negative 10 degrees in the mountains. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that, that, that's the kind of shit, excuse me. That's the kind of stuff that kept me, you know, that, that those are my sources of stress, man. I'm sure you have to give me some analogies like in your in your captaining days. There had to have been some point of stress if you're dealing with a lot of people, you know. Oh, well, when you're running those boats and those yachts and you're running all that stuff, every single thing on the boat is totally 100% your responsibility. The water, the fuel, the the food, and you got to do all that stuff. And then the weather is the biggest hurdle that people would never understand. They'd look at me and go, why is the wind blowing today? I'm like, what? 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 <laughs> what? Do you, what? Do you, what? I'd be like, what? If I could control the wind, I would be on an island and it would be surrounded by money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this the the we didn't have to worry about the elements of not having, but we had to worry about the elements of the boat not running, running out of fuel, running out of bait, running out of food, running out of water. Just so many different aspects all the time. Your head's spinning around all the time and uh the guides your guides are licensed guides my guides are licensed guides there's very few licensed guides in california because of the fact that people don't think they have to have a guy a guide license to guide people we have to have a guide license it's the law in the state of california but on the other hand my guides are guides for a reason because they know how to handle all the different scenarios that could come out on a boat. There's so many people doing black market guiding in California that you'd be blown away that it even happens. Sure. But they, people are doing it all the time. I don't know in your industry if that's even allowable or if that's a thing, but it probably is because everybody's trying to figure out a better, softer, kinder way to not have to pay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I, you know what I think, man, one, it's state by state. I would say that, uh, in the elk hunting world in that wilderness area there's illegal outfitters and illegal guides but man there, I, I think i think there's probably more in in your world just because it just because an outfitter in a wilderness area who's elk hunting he, it's very he, people can recognize exactly what you're doing right you can see the wall you can see the big wall tent camps there's like there's a bunch of there's a bunch of you're just clear variable you're clear things that other people can observe that know that you're doing it for money so it's pretty easy for them to 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 you know you know but bust down on it and it's great it's crazy dave but in the state of colorado i don't know how this got passed and it was before my time but it's actually a felony to illegally guide in colorado that's probably a good thing, right? Because yeah, well, I'm mean, yeah, I was all I'm I'm all I'm all for it, but it just seemed like wow, like that's throwing the book at guys, you know. So somebody that makes laws must have went out and had a really bad experience. Yeah, maybe, dude. Or you know, or somebody who makes laws had like had some buddies in the outfitting business, right? Who knows? 
<laughs> and they wanted to make sure no one was doing anything illegal. Yeah. But the thing that I think is probably the thing I want to know about the most is when, because here's what I get a lot is the people get on my guide to boats or they get on, they used to go with me and they go, I want to catch a big bluefin. And I'm like, okay, how, how, how long you been fishing? This is my first time. I'm like, huh? Wow. Do you get that with the elk thing a lot? Oh, oh yeah, man. They never it, shot a gun, but they want to get an elk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's crazy, Dave, because there's so many analogies in the hunting world to the fishing world on that front. And I see it from, from both sides. Like I've done a whole lot of fishing in my life. You know, I've done a fair, fair amount of spear fishing, but I go on a lot of guided, you know, I go on a lot of guided stuff and my, my uncle down your way, um, was a fishing guy too. So I saw, I saw it on his, his end and that, that now that it's so analogous in the hunting world that people, it's almost like people have to be exposed to it a few times to realize how much goes in to, you know, that picture of a free range elk that's dead or the guy who's, you know, who rod and reeled in a hundred pound Wahoo or the guy who shot a 30 pound Wahoo with his spear gun. Like you, you can see the pictures and I think it's gotten worse, man. Cause Instagram it's like, Oh, boom. Like I want that. So I'm going to call up Dave and I'm going to get that. I'm going to call up Cliff and I'm going to get that. You don't see all the work that goes, that goes in it, you, you know, in, into it. So the funniest thing to me on the subject, Dave, and I don't know if you experience this, but some of the easiest people for me to guide in my business were fishing guides, you know, hunting guides from other niches in the hunting world. Because they knew they 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 had seen it from both sides, and they would come to these things and be like, "Hey, man, like I understand that I might have to book. You know, I don't. I may not have the disposable income to go elk hunting with you every year, but I'm viewing this as like a six year mission. I'm gonna book three trips with you over the next six years, and I really hope you know we can get it done. And the, the, you know, a lot of times those guys. Uh, were the best clients and almost always we would achieve achieve their goal because they kind of saw it from both sides I, I don't I mean I don't know your thoughts on it I don't really blame people who have screwed up expectations about guided trips but later on in my business man I became cruel about adjusting those expectations because I realized that if I could if I could stop people early on from booking with me that had you know you know expectations that were off you know off kilter then i could just avoid a bunch of problems it, it, young guides and stuff that hit me up about outfit the outfitting world i'm like the best thing you can do is just make sure that people know what they're getting into that you're that, you know make sure your clients know what they're getting into and it'll save you so many hassles man oh yeah i can only imagine in your world because they show up with these great expectations because they saw you with the elk, with the giant antlers. Yeah. And like, I want that. And you're like, okay, how many times have you hunted? Well, I've not hunted yet, but I know that I can get one because you got one. You're like, no, that's not. Yeah. 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 Dude, <clears throat> I, I have to laugh, uh, Dave, because I hear like one of my, I don't know if you have like bucket list kind of things you want to do in your own life. Like, you know, fish you want to catch or, or whatever, but I've always kind of been like that. I always want to explore like, you know, new niches and hunting, new niches and fishing and spear fishing or whatever. And like, uh, it's been I don't know, nine months. I was kind of obsessed with like, Oh, I want to go blue water spear fishing and I want to, and I want to shoot a Wahoo, which to me was like this lofty, this lofty goal. And in that world, in that world, that's kind of like one of the cool fish to get, you know? So I started doing my research I've dove and spearfished, you know, I'd say I'm like amateur level or whatever um, in this, in the spectrum of things. And the craziest thing is, is I was talking to some guys down here in Rincon and, and one of my favorite things to do is to try to find, like try to find the Dave Hansen in the world that I'm, I'm trying to accomplish this goal. Like I want to figure out like the best guy and go with him or, you know, with his guides or whatever. So I found this guy down here, his name is Tony Dooley. And, uh, and I, I, I remember talking to him on the phone. I'm like, dude, I want to, you know, I want to do the Wahoo thing. And he, and he said the same thing. I could tell he's experienced because he's like, dude, it's going to take you, it might take you three or four times to do it. Right. And uh, I have to laugh because 
I, I, the first time I went with him, I shot two of them. <laughs> just <laughs> luck, dude. And he's like, he's like taking pictures of me. Like we're both floating out in the open water, you know, open water, you know, there's sharks way down below the flasher and that sort of thing. But we're taking pictures with the Wahoo. And uh, he like, while we're taking pictures, he's like, Cliff, I want you to know that this is not normal. <laughs> Right. And that's what you, that's what you get like because you don't you don't want people to have the wrong expectations you know yeah that, yes. there he is nice it's kind of different than hunting right because the way that the spear moves through the water is a little different than the way the bullet moves the the perspective <laughs> underwater that whole thing is totally different than what you do I mean people go oh well you're an elk hunter this should be not it's a totally different world right. It's totally yeah. different. I mean, there's 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 crossover, Dave. But I think spear fishing, dude. I, I I beg to say it has more to do with rod and reel fishing than it does hunting. I mean, they all have overlap. But I think there's. I mean, you have understanding of all the different species that you've fished for, probably at a level because you've iterated so many times on it. And you've used this type of chum and then this type of bait, this type of lure and that sort of lure. Like you've iterated on it so much. You have this built up like catalog of knowledge about the specific species. I think that's more relevant than like the marksmanship part, right? And spearfishing, like putting the gun out there and shooting the fish. Yeah, that's that's the same as hunting. But it, there's so many other things that don't have to do with like the, pulling the trigger part of it like learning the behavior of wahoo or or whatever species that you're going after is huge man i mean i'm sure i'm sure you see that like people don't understand like i'm sure i'm sure i could go fishing you know for for one of your specific species that you focused on and it would just be like like the like a, a skyscraper of knowledge just like trying to squeeze through a little hole to get into my brain you know <laughs> Well, thank you for that. I don't know about that, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I take it for granted a lot when I think in me and my guides, we think, gosh, don't they understand? Well, no, because you can't just like in your hunting world, you can't understand until you actually get out there and do it. And it's just like you were saying, we do done it for so long. We have to always step back and go, okay, well, wait a minute. These people haven't done this yet. So they don't yeah, even yeah. know. They don't know what's in store, what's it going to take. The thing I think that got me the most, though, is when that bluefin, and we call East Coast, they can't even catch the ones we catch, but the uh, people would catch their bluefin on the boat, and they couldn't even wind it in, and we'd have to finish it off for them or whatever, and we'd get all yeah. done. <clears throat> we'd get all done catching it, and they'd look at me and go, hey, can we get another one? I'd be like... <laughs> Why did that one? Let's go home. And they're like, no, no, you got six yesterday. We want to, we want to beat yesterday. I'm like, my deck hands are burnt out. They can't wind another one in. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. There's there's some similar analogies to, to hunting, man. Um, it's all it's all about expect I mean, it's all about expectations, man. It's the same, same deal. And I'm in the same deal with fishing too. Some of the best clients I had, Dave, well, some of the worst clients I had that I guided on, you know, really remote trips where it was just me and one other guy for six, seven days. And I knew a client was not going to enjoy the trip or they weren't going to be my favorite person to hunt with. If they never just said, man, this place is beautiful. Like, you know, this, like this landscape is beautiful. Like this area is stunning. It, I knew if I had a guy who commented on that and was just enjoying the, you know, enjoying that component of it, like we were going to have probably very high potential for success. But the guys that never mentioned just like the beauty of the place we were in, they usually didn't have success because they were just, it just doesn't work out if that's the only reason you're there, you know? They just want to show a picture of it. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Like, oh. You're like, dude. Yeah, yeah. Down here, look at how bitching this is. Something that I didn't, and I got a lot of stuff I want to ask because I'm geeking out that you're here. Let's be yeah, honest. Yeah, go ahead. I was listening to your podcast. You and Joe were talking. That mountain goat, that mountain, that that high up in the mountains, that goat, the way they can walk on the ledges and stuff. And you guys were talking about that animal, and I was just enthralled, and I started getting deep into it and 
watching more videos. And I seen, I saw this video. I don't know if you've seen it, where the mountain lion grabs that thing and and then they roll down the mountain like forever. <coughs> and at the bottom, the mountain lion still just going bananas. And the thing probably rolled down the mountain five, six hundred feet down. It was just the most incredible thing. And you used to hunt for those things. Yeah, yeah. So I used to, oh I used to guide three or four mountain goat hunts a year, and they're the they're the big white one. Yeah, um, that's what I was watching. And, yeah, man. And it's it's funny, Dave, because probably you know, there's well, I know this from my experience, like spear fishing. There's just dumb fish, and then there's smart fish, and they all have different types of behavior they use to avoid predators. In mountain goats, most people's observation them as a prey species is that they're stupid like they're dumb as a as a doorknob you know but they're really not stupid it's just they depend on the terrain man like you can i i i've i've been up at thirteen thousand feet a hair under fourteen thousand feet way above timberline and jumped a mountain goat and they will literally run 20 feet from you and just crawl up the steepest thing ever and they'll just sit there because They've evolved. Yeah, there's some good video videos that of them. Unbelievable! That video, and, is so big. dude. In all that country, like all that video that that Elliot's shown right now, it in real life, it's so much worse. Like it's so much steeper. It's so much nastier. When you look up at it, man, it makes it like your heart palpitates. Like, dude, are we are we actually gonna try to go up there? Because um, they just love the nastiest terrain. But what I was getting at is that's what they depend on. They depend on getting somewhere where not only can a human not get them, but a lion can't get them. Like they literally want to sit somewhere where a mountain lion can't crawl up and get them. So you can imagine they they like, you know, they like nasty terrain, but super fun to hunt. Um, I, I, uh, I always tell people that that's it's like my favorite, one of my favorite species to hunt, but it's also the first species that I'll quit hunting because it's most physical demand it's most physically demanding you know at well, some point you know go ahead yeah, i saw it the the areas that you're taking and you're walking into is just absolutely mind-boggling to me as a as a oh, sure. i'm like how in the hell did he get up there and then i listened a little bit more and you're going and there's many times where you had the cleanest shot you could have but you're like no i'm not going to take because there's no way i'm going to get the animal there's oh, no yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, that is, that is awesome because that shows me how much you respect the animal that you're hunting or me. How oh, much yeah. yeah. That I'm fishing because you have a total respect for that animal because you've gone and you've tried to walk where that animal's walking. And you're like, if I, we could have the shot and you're one of your clients has the shot, but you're like, no, don't take the shot because we'll never get them. You're looking down that. Yeah, you're looking down. Oh, the yeah. Side. Yeah, yeah. We'll never get that guy. That's pretty badass, though, to know. And then oh, that, yeah. You, yeah, you get, a, you get a good feel for where you can get them and where it's going to be really, really trying. Believe me, Dave, like after I've had to use ropes and stuff to get them out a couple times or been in situations that were like, you know, you're like one misstep and you're going to die type of deal. And once you do that a couple times, you get a really good feel for like, hey, we should shoot it there or we shouldn't. You know what I mean? You you get a good idea and uh, you you develop kind of a sixth sense about it, you know. Right. That that ram that that you put up on it. Oh yeah. I read all about it, kind of paid attention. That's kind of a interesting thing because I just want to tell you, I went pig hunting up in Northern California with on one of my uh clients' ranches up there. He's got a massive, it's a stupid ranch. The guys are oh, okay. But uh me and my son went. And we, I couldn't even, I don't even know how you guys find the animal, how you guys get the animal, how you guys figure out where the animal is. The guy, we get on his forerunner and he's all, okay, I know where it is. And I'm like, okay, we drive like five miles and then we hike down this hill and there it is, like <laughs> at the bottom, he run, goes right to it. I'm like, how do you guys do that? That is so incredible. I'm sorry, Marley just knocked over my water right here. I just got to get it before it gets there. Marley, stop it. Yeah, there. Sorry about that, Marley. Good. Marley's pretty active. He sees you on there. He's jumping all around, making sure you can't get a beat on him. 
I like the little uh, the videos you posted of him with the worms. Yeah, he got 500 worms for Christmas from his mommy, and he's loving it. But he loves to eat those mealworms. That keeps him very, very active. But he's running all over here. I don't know. He likes the sound of your voice or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I hear you, man. It's just like I'm sure when you're a guy and a fisherman, it's just that iteration, man. Like, you know, like you, you could probably go to a – I mean, don't you – I mean, is it there that kind of feeling, Dave, like when you're guiding fishermen, like you, when you get to a certain spot or you know that, Hey, with these sets of variables, like this is the spot to be and kind of before you even put the line in the water, like you've got a pretty good feel like it's going to be a good day or not. You know, I think that's all just intuition from iteration, you know? Oh yeah. It's blown a lot of people's minds. I'll be, uh, in what way I said, I'll be licking my chops. I'll see the conditions. I'll see the current. I'll see the color of the water. I'll see what's going on. And I'm like, Oh, my heart's hard to palatate. I know we're going to get them here. I know that the magic's going to happen at this spot. People are like, how did you know? It's just because we know. It's just what we look at every single day. Real quick, though, I know we're having a great conversation. I just want to let everybody know tonight is going to be the most incredible hoop netting trip we've ever done. We do these live lobster trips at night, and I know you've seen a little bit of them. We take tonight's going to be incredible. Ryland. Justin's son is going to be the deckhand on, on a bowline sport fishing boat. And we have, it's a kid's trip only. Justin's going to drive the boat. Jake, his deckhand is going to be there just in case something happens. But the kids are running the whole show. They're going to be baiting the hoops. They're going to be throwing the hoops. They're going to be pulling the hoops. It's going to be an incredible show tonight. It starts at six o'clock on my YouTube channel, gang. Your saltwater, or not YouTube, excuse me. Sorry, Elliot. On my Facebook channel, Elliot's like, don't do that to me. <laughs> on my Facebook channel, it'll be live at six o'clock. The kids are going to be fishing lobster. There's Justin. His son, Ryland's going to be the deckhand. He's going to be running the show tonight. We see a lot of adults doing it, but tonight's all kids all the time. It's going to be incredible. I don't want you to miss it. All of our big sponsors have stepped up and donated a ton of phenomenal equipment to all the children. They're going to get rods and reels, gloves, hats, stickers, beanies, all kinds of stuff. But yeah, that's what we're going to be doing tonight, gang. I want to make sure you all watch that on our YouTube, on our Facebook. Sorry, Elliot. On our Facebook <laughs> channel. Elliot's like, don't do that to me. On our Facebook channel, your saltwater guide. So check it out, gang. And, uh, I just wanted to throw that out there before we got further into this gang. We got, I promised Cliff that we'd show for an hour. He's got a ton of stuff in his life going on. As you know, me and Elliot got a ton of stuff going on. So we got about 12, 15 minutes left to talk here, gang. If there's anything that you want to absolutely need to know from Cliff, you can ask the questions. He can see them. We'll throw them up on the screen just like that. We just threw up Devin. <laughs> ask that. Talk to <coughs> Guys, let them know what's going on. I mean, we never even got into fishing at all, Cliff, but we'll talk about it a little bit here. But you're yeah, hunting. Yeah, yeah. bitch. Do you ever have yeah, yeah. hunters? Yeah, yeah. So I see the question there. So so I so I've done a fair amount of spring bear hunting. Like I had a business spring bear hunting and then fall bear hunting. So obviously we encountered bears that way. Um yeah, I've had I've had my my fair share of them for sure. Nothing nothing crazy, you know, crazy, you know, that I was gonna die from one or whatever. Um, there's actually I told a short story on on the Joe Rogan podcast about a bear and and her cubs. So I'll leave that one for later. But I did have uh, probably the hairiest grizzly bear interaction I ha I've had was in British Columbia. <laughs> I remember it, Dave. So. I was, we're in this bear camp. It was north of Prince George, which is always, is already, you know, way up, way up on the north side of British Columbia. And the thing about it is, is your days in the spring when you're hunting, it's like, a, I'm sure you've been up there before in Alaska and that sort of thing. Like the day, it almost never gets dark, right? So we get up in the morning, we've got a bunch of, a bunch of hides to salt and turn, which is just a process that you do to, to, to store them um, because we were in a, such a remote area. We didn't have refrigeration. You, you got to salt all the hides. So anyways, we have one cabin that's just got bear hides and skulls in it. And we get up in the morning and it's like four 30 in the morning and we look out. Well, I go, I get up and I walk over to the side of the guide cabin and my buddy is already sitting there and he's kind of looking off 
and he's looking across to the cabin that's got all the hides in it, like the salting cabin. And I look over and there's this ramp, like going into the cabin, like a walk up ramp. And I noticed the doors open and I noticed there's salt like all over the ramp there. You know what I mean? And I'm like, huh. And it doesn't really strike me. I'm not too worried about it. And then I, I ask Jim, I'm like, Jim, have you been in the salting shed this morning or did we leave the door shut? And we like both realize it at the same time, like, oh, crap. Like something's been in there and screwing with the skulls and the hides. So we go, so we run over there. We both run over there. We go in there. Two hides are missing and one skulls missing. And you can see all the salt. Cause I mean, we put like, we'll put 50 pounds of salt on the top of a hide. So you can see this drag of salt, like down into the, you know, the marshy crap behind the, behind the, behind the camp. We're like, oh man. So I remember walking back in there and just and it's really thick like a lot of british columbia is not what people see in the pictures it's actually kind of moose swampy so it's really thick we get back in there and i remember looking like 60 yards in front of me and there's this grizzly and i swear to you dave he's sitting like a dog like his feet like his his tails like under him and he's just sitting there like this and he's got one of the black bear skulls in front of him and then he's got like the two hides like piled up there and he's just like sitting there like yogi bear <laughs> and he and like you know how those animals are like if you catch them in those situations they're you know they're they're just doing their thing but immediately when they notice you they like they're like a lightning bolt right and i remember that bear like he noticed us and he he just started just running through the brush and I bail and start running, just hauling butt back to camp to get behind, <laughs> to get behind a, you know, get a truck between me and the bear. And this grizzly's just like crashing through this stuff, primarily, I think, just to get away from us. But uh, I, I lived with that for like weeks. Those guys are harassing me. They're like, dude, Cliff just bailed, jumped on the other side of the truck. He was like the first one out of there. But uh, it was funny because the, that one of those hides, the grizzly had torn the ear off of it. And I told the hunter, I was like, dude, taxidermist can fix that or whatever. And he's like, no way, dude. Like, this is an awesome story. So he actually has it mounted in his house with the ear, with the ear missing. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a phenomenal story. Everybody For the story, the story of the Grizz in camp. Did you see what Matt just asked? I, I know. Uh, sorry, man. What was your proudest moment when hunting? My proudest moment when hunting. Ah, oh, man. That's a, that's a hard one. I'd have to kind of think, I have to kind of think about that. You know, <clears throat> probably my, my proudest moment in hunting, it might've actually been this year. I went back, I went back and guided three mountain goat hunts in a row in Colorado. And they were with my old crew who I haven't, when I sold my outfitting business, one of the primary, primary reasons I sold it, Dave, is that at that time I knew I had like, I, I had the best crew I had ever had. And I knew if somebody bought it, they would be, that crew could run it for them. So I, that was one of the reasons I sold it, if, if that makes any sense to you. Oh. But anyways, yeah. So anyways, two years later, I went back and I guided three back-to-back -back mountain goat hunts with them. And a lot of it was my old crew. And this sounds corny, man, but we just, we just nailed it, dude. Like, within nine days we had killed all three goats they were all remote backpack stuff like crazy rough country and just to see you know just to see all those guys that had worked with me for four or five six seven years just you know just just like continue to progress when i wasn't there it's just it's just pretty cool because i know that my business has been a big part of their life but i also realized like oh dude like i sold it my business is still going they're still doing a good job so you know, it's something to be proud of. Oh, absolutely. Because all you got at the end of the day is your name. You yeah, know, yeah, sure. That's your business that you turned over to those guys. That's, that's really cool. That's, I'm putting together a nice group of uh, guides and I'm hoping one day they take over my thing because it's pretty yeah. cool to watch them succeed and watching Justin at the level that he's at right now and doing what he's doing with these live hoop net trips. I couldn't be happier. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Martin asked a question. Do you have to have a tag to do the bear thing? Uh, in Colorado, you can just buy it. So you can just buy. So black bears, 
black bears you could just buy the tags in colorado it for most for most of the state idaho same deal some places there's tags it just varies man you know all the all the different game the, I, the 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 overall answer to his question is there's a bunch of states where you can just buy black bear tags and go hunting because why are they a menace are they a they're yeah they're like they're they're high population you know like like in the in that area that i grew up in and did a lot of my outfitting when i was a kid dave there were no black bears like my dad when he was cattle ranching outfitting like if you saw one black bear a season that was a lot uh when i was outfitting there you know we'd see 50 black bears a season there there were there were years where we we harvested 16 17 black bears so the population is for sure you know rising it's just like it's like it's like Every ecosystem, I think, has this, Dave. Like, like you, I know you hit on the sea lion thing a lot. Yeah, I mean, there's a rise in in uh, you know predator populations. You know, down here in Puerto Rico with the spear fishing, everybody will tell you that there's way more sharks than there used to be. Um, so that that dynamic dynamic is very analogous across a lot of different a lot of different niches in the outdoors. You know. Yeah, well, we're going to open that door up a little bit right now about the thing because when I was a kid running sport boats, my dad was running sport boats in the 70s and the 80s. We didn't have that sea lion problem like we have today. There were many, many trips where I would run the boat, San Clemente Island, Catalina, fishing the coast. We wouldn't see a sea lion. Now, you can't go anywhere. There's nowhere to go where you're not going to see them. We got them all over down here in Cabo San Lucas. They're up in the Sea of Cortez. They run up and down the Baja like massive amounts. But the big problem now is up in Alaska and Oregon and Washington, they're decimating the salmon populations like you can't even comprehend. This is the most overpopulated, unregulated animal on the planet Earth. And you doing the honey thing, if you let an animal just run free without any regulation and out without with zero there is no predator for the sea lion everyone says right. oh the killer whale oh the killer whale they're different killer whales some only eat salmon some only eat tuna some only eat dolphin very very few of them eat the sea lion it's not right. a fun animal to eat it doesn't taste that great it's a mean animal it bites them so they're not a they're not there's no predator and there's no uh there's nothing happening except massive population every nine months the number doubles we'll say it's four million right now think about that in nine months it's gonna be eight I, i'm good at my twos so yeah the two times tables i can do those because i stayed <laughs> all the way up to ninth grade so the two times are good it's a it's gonna be eight million next year we already know it's more than four, but we'll just say eight million in nine months. In 18 months, it's going to be a ridiculous number. And just there's no regulation in any way, shape or form of these animals. And they are from Alaska to the Sea of Cortez. It's pretty bad the way they're doing it. Because most of the animals that they're eating today, they didn't even know there was a sea lion in them because there wasn't. There's no sea lions in rivers and streams, but there is now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, my overarching thought on this topic, Dave, is that, cause I, I saw it, you know, with wolves, mountain lions, bears, you know, down here in the spear fishing world, I've seen it with sharks. I think there's this, the, unfortunately, a lot of people think that if we go back to, you know, some, there's some, that, like somehow we can go back to this perfect ecosystem before there was, you know, 8 million people in L the LA greater area. You know what I mean? Like we can go back before that and the ecosystem can heal itself. And I think it's just a far-fetched idea. And a lot of these different issues, they're all the same, man. And like the, to me, the big, the big issue like you have with the sea lion thing is the, is basically the law implies that there cannot be management. Is that right? They, you basically, you can't, you there's, the chances of there being a season to kill them and eat them is pretty, pretty low. Yeah, there's zero management allowed because the law was written in 1967 when there absolutely was a problem. But there was, if they looked into the law and looked at it the way it was written, when it got to a sustainable level, it was time to take away yeah. this law. It was time. That's how it was written. 
but then you know who got a hold of it. The environmentalist got a hold of it, and it doesn't matter what the law says now. It's just it's the Bible. It is it. There's, yeah, yeah. It's like the Ten Commandments. This is it. It's there's no way around it. We're not going to go after the sea lion. And my dad, he traveled. He was a big politician. He traveled all over the 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 uh, political for, and they can't even talk about it. It's a subject that yeah. you can't talk about in Washington. You can't talk about it in Sacramento. You cannot talk about the sea lions. The whole place goes, <gasps> yeah, yeah. And everybody takes a deep breath and they just go, nope, don't talk about it as they destroy. I know. I mean, it not it funny how certain things are just, certain things are like that, man. And, and from an outsider to some extent on this topic, Dave, like my view is like, well, you know, if there's an excess amount of them, you know, how do they taste? Are they, you know, or would they be fun to, you know, to, to hunt or whatever like that? It, it, I have this like harebrained view on it, right? Like, well, why not? Why not have some consumptive use of them? But, you know, I would get thrown out of, I'd get thrown out of any senator's office if I brought that up. Oh, absolutely. And they got to be good to eat. They eat fish. Yeah, sure. Oh, sure. it's got to be a good, I bet the back strap is incredible. Did, oh, yeah. I yeah. I, I didn't mean to say that. Maybe we can cut that out later. <laughs> but uh, well, there's there's whole populations of people that live off similar animals. You know, oh, the Eskimos get to take some. They get to eat them. They get to have sure. some. But the sea lion's not supposed to be in Alaska, but now it is. So they're devastating the other sea sea life up there. Just like just like the the bears we were talking about. And when I drive through. Uh, Texas, I'm blown away at all the deers laying all over the side of the road. That looks oh, like yeah. the easiest way to hunt a deer, like Ron White says, is in a van with your <laughs> Dude, I, you know, you, you brought up the Rogan deal, so I have to make a comment on it. Because the night that I did Rogan, I met Ron White, and I was oh. like so pumped. Because he was literally the comic that my dad watched and my mom watched, but they wouldn't let me watch because he's so dirty. You know what I mean? So meeting him in real life, I was like, dude, I can't believe I'm meeting Ron White. <laughs> <laughs> that is so great. That's kind of, to be honest with you, gang, I geek out a lot. We get to bring in a lot of great guests. I, that's how I felt today with you, Cliff. I know <laughs> I told you before we went live, I, I interview a lot of really big names in the industry, but I was super nervous because you just did the Rogan podcast. I'm like, I hope you don't <laughs> blow this. I hope I don't. <laughs> Wait. No, man. It was, I've had a good time, dude. To be honest, we've already blown through an hour. We got a great go here. I, we never even really got into your passion now about fishing. And you were like, well, Dave, I'm not an expert. It doesn't matter. None of us are. We're just going <laughs> out doing what we love, right? Look at you're doing. Oh, you know what was really cool? And Mike Lewis, you probably had to go back to work, but Cliff just put out a video of popcorn lobster legs, dude. And he's not. <laughs> That's right. There's no hate on yours like there is on mine. I'm the most hated person <laughs> because of my popcorn lobster legs. Well, you didn't do it. You didn't pull the legs off while the lobster was alive. <laughs> Me and my yeah, spirit. dude. Maybe, maybe I. I was thinking like, well, I'm gonna knock this video off from Dave because on his channel it's got a million views. So that's probably the part that I missed, man. You got to do live extraction. Oh, that that <laughs> set the whole world on fire. They didn't understand that. Ten minutes after Mike made that, he dropped the lobster in boiling water. <laughs> They're like you. You pulled his legs off while he was alive and ate it in front of him. I'm like, do you really think that lobster has a personality? Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, we ate him. Crazy. That's funny, man. It's a great trick, though. Is is Mike Lewis the one? Is, is uh, who you're mentioning? Is he the one who invented it, or is he the original? No, Mike went lobster. Mike's one of my buddies, and he went lobster fishing for the first time, and he caught there. It is. He caught that nice lobster. Sure. And we were just talking on the phone and I said, Hey, you want to try something really cool? He goes, sure. He goes, put yeah. that in a bag and put it in the microwave and film it for me. Cause I have, I don't have that video in my rotation and he's all, what's going to happen. I go, watch, set it for 30 seconds and watch and just stand there and watch. And the meat's going to shoot out. We call it a popcorn lobster leg. And he was like, no way. And he, him and Jamie did it, and it pops up. Did you see when his wife pushed the microwave button with their fingernails? 
he, she's got black paint on her fingernails. If Elliot oh, okay. went, oh my gosh, so many people are calling me and Mike names because we paint our fingernails. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they think it's they think it, they think it's his. That's funny, man. <laughs> Dude, I don't know how, the the lobsters here when you do it, Dave. Like it pops, man. Like oh, it'll yeah. scare you. It, it, it blows out of there so fast. So watch, watch the microwave. Oh well, I was gonna say, watch when they push the button on the microwave, and if you went down the rabbit hole, you'd see the thousands of comments about the fingernail polish. Oh yeah, dude. That's it. It's so funny how it, the, when these videos get traction, something something people will pick up on and they'll go crazy about and it's something you didn't even notice when you posted it right yeah see the nail polish they went bananas yeah. me, and, me and lewis are like what <laughs> nail polish and oh jamie's finger pushed the microwave oh yeah there you go well hey gang i want to thank everybody for watching this this was so much fun cliff and i'd love to get together and do it with you again this was a wonderful time next time maybe we'll do an hour and a half or something because we never even talked about fishing but, yeah, man. I hope it didn't bore. Hope it didn't bore your audience with the with the hunt and talk. I I wanted to talk about fishing, Dave. <laughs> and I wanted to geek on your hunting stuff because it's so <laughs> cool. And I watch it all, and I'm like, gosh, I know the fishing thing. I want to know about this hunting thing. <laughs> I want to know all about it. But Elliot, thank you so much for your time. I know you got to get going, Elliot. Go have a beautiful holiday. He's going to take a couple days off and go enjoy life. If you're on that podcast tonight, Elliot, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> don't come on with don't come on and help us stay with your wife and hang out gang we're going to go live at six o'clock tonight you're going to get to see some phenomenal hoop netting with children it's going to be incredible i promise you we won't let you down it'll be an awesome show make sure you tune in at six o'clock on my on my facebook channel your saltwater guide cliff thank you so much what a fun guest that was a ball yeah of course man thanks for having me everybody i'll see you on on uh monday if you don't watch our show tonight, remember what I always say, turn off the news. They're all lying. I'll be back with you on Monday to tell you the truth.